I would challenge you today to look at art from a different angle, a little bit more secular. And since I'm a professor in a secular university, so I'm best at that. Um, but just to show you that I also prepared something from the Bible. <laughs> the first place where the Bible talks about art, almost everyone agrees that it, um, uh, Exodus 31st, when Bezalel receives the gift. Now, my husband did 30 years ago almost uh, a whole series on Bezalel. He wanted to name our son Bezalel. <laughs> and I told him, in your dreams. <laughs> So his name is David now. <laughs> um, but we have this story that we hang on as being the, somehow the funding of uh, the gift of art and also uh, a little bit the beginning of performance. And that's a whole other subject if we were to talk about performances in the Bible, that it's fascinating and much more troubling than anything that I'm going to show you. But I looked a little bit at that text, and I was thinking, the what? What was given then? And then was given wisdom, knowledge, understanding, skills, and craftsmanship. And that was really, Bezalel was really lucky because he got them all, we all presume, miraculously. Uh, while you have to work on your skills, whatever art you, you have. But anyway, that's, that's what God gave people. And then for what, how, how, in what form these were to be expressed. So we have their artistic design. We have uh, uh, sculpture, especially metal sculpture. We have some stone, we have wood. Uh, we also have, in terms of what kind of object, if we look there, how was given architecture, uh, Sculpture that was a bit utilitarian because you could put in it objects. We also had furniture, so industrial design we would call it today, with a table, lampstands, and other stuff. We had textiles, we have perfumes, and then we had performance. The whole ritual is what today we would call a performance. And these were given to certain artists and um, skilled helpers, what we would call craftsmen. And also, for whom that was given? Well, God was the first client. He commissioned a work, and he gave very specific um, um, uh, instructions on how to be made, which any artist would hate if they would have such a client these days, to be so specific about the sizes and everything. But let's say he was the first one who commissioned, and it, this can be a model for us. And also, all these were for people to use and enjoy later. So it wasn't for God, actually. He commissioned it for us in the end. So I want you to look a little bit at the, for who was this, the artist. And we talked about the gift of creativity. Was it given just for artists? Or people tend to say that we are all creative and we could all be artists. Also, I want you to think about, if not all can be artists, if it's from God, maybe only Christians can be artists. So if, if people do not acknowledge this as being the God come from heaven on top of them, are there artists or not? Are there non-Christian artists or artists that even are against God? Are we allowed to watch that art, to enjoy that art, to relate to that art, if we say we are Christian. So I want us to step a little bit into the art world, the, the real one, the one around us, and not in, in this uh, protected tent that we are in right now. And I would start with the question of questions that you ask artists. What is art? actually. A Sunday school uh, uh, um, class, five to six years old, and they are asked, what is small, cute, has a little tail, big ears, and is jumping from place to place? And the little girl says, I would say it looks like a rabbit, but we all know Jesus is the answer. <laughs> 
So please know art is God's creative gift because we all know that is true. So let's just step out of it and anything that it's not that, think as secular as you can. What is art? And uh, um, Natalie is going to, to, to put it down there. And then we'll be able to relate a little bit to some of the things that I show you. Communication. Okay, communication. Self-expression. Self Good. And you will identify yourself in, in different definitions because we're going to go through some of them. What else? Can you be more specific? A product of, a, of the culture. Language is a product of the culture. I don't know. So, more, a bit more specific. Art. Yes, it is within the, the, the context of the culture. But what it is, what is it? Okay, you can write there a reflection of culture, of reality, whatever. Yes, please. A tool to be used for what? Because then there is a purpose if it's a tool. Just a second. It can be used to fill out time, to fill out space, at least as far as fills space. Yeah, it definitely fills my husband's time. I, I can tell you that. If, that. if art is a fill of time, your time is filled. <laughs> you are an artist. <laughs> Talking about art, it, it, some of the definitions started since uh, the ancient times, but the real discussion about the beginning of aesthetics that started, it, it's a philosophical discipline that starts to really look at what art is. The beginning of uh, uh, aesthetics started with Francis Hutchinson, Francis Hutchinson, who calls it art, it's morality, and he says it's beauty, order, harmony, design, first treatment of the subject. These are all quotes from these authors. Uh, Ashley Anderson Cooper, called also the Earl of Shaftesbury, even in the literature. He says, there is no truly aesthetic delight that did not include God, nor is there any true moral pleasure that did not include the beautiful. Okay, so we're talking here about 16th, 17th, 18th century authors that started to look at this. And uh, also he says it's like magic art. It helps the world to better interact with the reality. You already uh, uh, described some of this. And he gives the example of Uncle Tom's Cabin, that it changed the way people viewed slavery, talking about the hammer, the fact that art can shape society by, by the ideas that are expressed there. Now, they also linked aesthetics to ethics. And what did that work tell you? I don't know if you the, know the work, but this author, Marco Evarizzi, in 2000, exhibited a number of mixers filled with water, with a golden fish inside, and the viewers were allowed to push the button. Okay, so this tells more about the viewer and not the artist. But they were allowed to do this. However, it is not ethical. It's not considered to be an ethical work just because it was, let's say, cruel to animals. But here I would give the example, and I didn't put it in here, but I, I thought I, I must mention it. The example of Marina Abramovic, who is an um, art performer who had some very troubling and, and striking performances, and one of them I don't know if not even at MoMA in New York, but anyway, in a big, uh, in a big uh, uh, exhibition, uh, said, here's my body, do whatever you want with it. And she made her body available for eight hours at a time for people to do whatever they want. And there were people who came and caressed her. There were people who came and grabbed her touched her inappropriately. She almost got raped. There were people who beat her with roses and she was all blood. And she would not react, that was her performance. And that might be very shocking and at first I was like, who would do that? 
but actually her point was not herself, but was you. What do you do when you have full freedom to do something to another being? And it's about the same thing that you find here. So this is beginning of aesthetics. And I, I dare point, I dare point to the fact that most likely most of us do not go beyond this. We, we stay within the framework of the beginning of aesthetics of the 18th, 19th century. You see, there is a lot of skepticism even about the possibility of having a definition. Because there are so many things involved that you cannot find a common ground. And one author said, the concept of art defies definition. Another one said, um, you know, you cannot talk about I like it or I do not like it because that is just moving to aesthetics and there are so many other levels where you can uh, discuss it. Um, Maurice White said works of art are defined by several categories of similarities and not by the essence of it. So you, you cannot really find a definition. Still, there were people who tried all kinds of definitions. And one that is very important and that came to me when I was asking questions about uh, artificial intelligence working with art, one that was pointed was the intentionality. It is not art if it was not intended to be art. You can make something very beautiful, but if you did not intend it to make it art, it's not art. If you find the most beautiful root in the forest and you take it home, that is not art in the sense of the definitions. You might say it's better than many other works of art, but it was not intentional. So for an art to be art, it has to be intentional. And I put this picture because that's the example that we were given. An elephant was taught how to draw. And he can draw this thing. This is the trunk of a, an elephant that can make this drawing. But that doesn't make it art. It just means that he was conditioned instinctively to follow certain movements that resemble art, but it is not art. So an elephant, yes, 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 a real elephant. You, you can find on YouTube and see him live how they are doing. That's made by an elephant that was trained to do those movements. Okay? And that's very important to remember because then the whole discussion about artificial intelligence, a machine cannot be creative. A machine is doing what it was programmed to do. And then we have the traditional definitions. Plato said that art is imitation or representation, imitation of reality. So many of you think alike Platon. Other, uh, Aristotle said art is neither political nor moral. So from this perspective, he would argue with you when you said it's militant. I believe it's militant, but that's some of the traditional definition. Tolstoy said, Art is a medium to convey feelings, and we had that also there, an expression of feelings. So these are some of the traditional definitions. It gets more complicated. You have the, the functionalist definitions of art that basically go back to the aesthetics, and they underline the aesthetic part of a work. And that's why I put a classical work of art, and the text would say something like, a work of art is either an arrangement of conditions intended to provide an ex aesthetic experience that is valuable for its mark aesthetic character and so on. I'll just say that the critics of functionalism say it's hard to find an angle or function that is served by all artwork. So even if you say that art is intended to, to, to give us pleasure, okay, but it's also intended to represent feelings, now what do we do? Do we cut off all the feelings that are not pleasurable? Are they not worthy of, of, of being put there? So the critics say that's not enough functionalism. It doesn't fit all the purposes of art. Other go to the procedur proceduralist definitions of art. And here comes institutionalism. So this definition is touching on the whole uh, uh, ecosystem around art. Because in art, you have the artist who is a person that intentionally does art. She's intentionally doing art. 
you have the work of art, and here is another discussion about the work of art that for a long time was defined as being just an object, a substance. The work of art had to have sub substance. It had to be a canvas, it had to be a painting, it had to be a sculpture, it had to be something that is an object. But more recently, art has moved towards conceptualism where if you look at that work of art, which by the way I love, if you look at that work of art, you wouldn't say it's an art, but the idea behind it, it's the work of art. So you have works of art that do not have a substance and can be weird as, as that. Who says that they are art? Who is validating them? And here you fall into institutionalism. Because next to the work of art, the arted, and the public, because a work of art is intended to be seen, if Michelangelo had made all his works and never brought them out to light from his studio, no matter how good they were, if they are not seen by a public, under this uh, definition, they are not qualified as art. But then you also have the art world and the institutions around it. There is out there a market for art. There are people, public, who not only enjoy it, but they also want to buy it. And actually, that's what makes you be able to live out of your art. And there is also an art world that has institutions that put labels on, yes, this is art, no, this is not art. So no matter what, if I go to, to MoMA and I see a banana like that and I said, this is rubbish. No, if it's in MoMA, somebody there that probably is more qualified than I am is able to decode something that I cannot, okay? I still have problem with uh, that uh, box that contains the SH thing. Uh, I'm still struggling to understand what that is, but it's there and uh, um, it's the same thing. It's, it's a conceptual art and you, we still have to, to find uh, uh, what that is. Now the critic to this say that not all art, art worlds are sufficiently institutionalized to generate a structure of roles and authorities that helps. And also don't forget that there are many art worlds. There is a tendency to only relate to the Western art world and to forget that there are other art worlds. Which bring us to the next definition, the historically reflexive definitions of art. And basically that says that an artifact, they don't call it a, a, an object anymore, cannot be considered art unless it has a prepared place in a line of history of development. So if my work comes from the Impressionists and then through the Cubists and this and, and I got here, then it's acceptable. But if it doesn't have anything behind it, then from the historical reflexive definition, it doesn't qualify as art. So here, if you were my student, I would, <laughs> I would highly encourage you to know your field and to know who was behind you so that you don't make things that you believe you invented the wheel when actually others did it before you and to see if you fit in this. It doesn't mean that you're not allowed to jump over this definition, which actually the all digital art did, and we'll get there in a minute. But one of the, 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 the criticism here is that there are several art worlds, and I put that painting, and if you look at it through the lenses of the Western art world, you wouldn't know where to qualify it. Where does it fit into, and there is a tendency for everyone to believe that the Western art world is the Unfortunately, even for the Asians, they start to look at the Western art world. Even the Middle Eastern, they, they made a Louvre and they want works from the West because they are not confident enough to promote their own uh, um, institutions and their own narrative regarding that. But you get the point with this point of view. So let's go to AI art, artificial intelligence. Now, many of you have already seen this painting by now. This painting has won a competition as, I don't know, somewhere in the States, as being the best work in the show. And it was made by a 
computer by machine. It was made in Mid Journey. Uh, here, Ephraim is, is working with, uh, with uh, Mid Journey. He knows exactly what that is. Now, it's not easy to get there. I tried, and you know, you have to master the, the uh, software. The title says uh, something in spatial theater, theater d'opera spatial, something like that. Now, what AI, I don't know how many of you know what AI is, how many played with it. There's, there were so many discussions in the last six months with it that no matter how much I'm interested, I turned the uh, channel, you know, because I don't want to hear it anymore. But I want to, one of the things that actually sent me to look at these definitions, and I presented it at a conference uh, last year uh, at my university, and it was the first time when I interacted with my ethicist colleagues who are philosophers in aesthetics, and I, I couldn't believe how complicated all these definitions are because I didn't deal with them before. But just think about it. How does the process of, of uh, art, creating artwork, it starts in your head, right? With an idea, maybe an image. Then, if you master the craft, if you worked enough to be able to move from your brain to your hand, you can make a piece. And what do you do then? When the piece is ready, you want to exhibit it, what do you do, Livio? You just mentioned before. You give it a title. Okay? So sometimes the title. <laughs> Sometimes the title is very uh, abstract. Sometimes the title is more explanatory. But you, you, you insisted that in order to decode a work of art, you need to have a title. <laughs> I, I didn't stay on one of the definitions, but in one of the definitions, uh, there's a full discussion about the intentionality of the artist. And some say that a work of art can mean only what the artist wanted, okay? Another one says, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter what the artist wanted. I'm gonna believe whatever I want. And we have here two examples. The chain cat and the monkey and the camera. The chain cat example, it's a classical one, in which they say there was a sculpture of a cat, a bronze cat, somewhere in a college on top of a stair. There was a stand and there was this cat. Because it wasn't that big, students would steal it and take it and place it somewhere else. And in order for the sculpture not to be stolen, they put a chain and they chained it <laughs> to the place. And it started to be known as the chained cat. And everybody looked, giving it a different meaning. Because all of a sudden, it's not just a, a cat, it's a chained cat. Do you see how some say it doesn't matter what you believe about it? And Livio does this exercise with he's showing his works, and sometimes I stop laughing in my head. I, I try to be civil, but, but the things that people see when Livio is unleashing them to see whatever they want have nothing to do with what he intended. Which is good. Which is, according to some, very good. Others say, no, you should stick to the meaning. Now, going back to A art. If the process of classical art is from head down and then you express it in words, maybe, AI is just the other way. You have to come up with the words because that's how the machine is built. You have to give it words. It's called a prompt. You have to give it a prompt to ask a question, to do something with it. And then it's going to process and bring out from what it has, what it was fed to it, and gives you an image. From here on, I just leave you with questions. Can computers create art? And if yes, based on what definition of art? What is art? Who is the artist in a work created by AI? And what is the artistic thing, the image or the words? What are the implications for artists and the art market? And that's very important to know that already 
uh, uh, many artists are protesting that they are starting to be uh, thrown out of the art world just because companies have a much easier way, much cheaper to get stock images or whatever they want. This photography won the first prize at a photography competition. Now, the, the author of the photography has entered many times into the Sony World Photography Awards, where even one of my students got there in the first 10, and was never accepted. But this one won the competition, and it was, it's artificial, it's not real. These are not real persons, they don't exist. He declared it, and he refused the prize. He declared it, and he said he wanted to make a point to show that if he used a machine, it was considered appropriate, but because it was made with artificial intelligence and it's not real, he would not take the award. So these are just some of the dilemmas of our, of our uh, time around uh, the use of artificial intelligence. And now, so I, I talked about text to image, and then you have image to image, so he, he fed an image and then it was uh, worked by artificial intelligence. And here we have AI in video. So video to video, and you will see some astounding results that have big implications in society. If you know where to look, you will see that this is fake because they are not that good. If you look around the mouth, sometimes you don't even see all the teeth. But if they can fake it and, and talk like this, then they, they can get away with it. So what are the implications in politics? What do we believe when we see something? And for the, the film industry, there are big questions ahead. Because now they talk about the fact that they can take the image of an actor, spend two weeks scanning him or her everywhere, and then sending them home and making movies for the next century with that person. Just because they have all their data, and there's talk about artists losing their jobs, but what he said is emotion. They are not yet at the level where they can show emotion, and definitely not the spontan emotion, but it's there. I'm just gonna draw a few conclusions that I want to leave you with. To be relevant, in a world that is going through such rapid changes and facing a public that is showered with information and bombarded with visual content, artists might, and, and here I was soft, you might benefit from a broader view of what art is, of getting out of the uh, bunny answer. <laughs> And even if you do not like it, you don't have to embrace it, but at least you have to understand other artists who are not having the same message, but they do have a message and their message is impacting the world. And if you want to impact the world, you also have sometimes to learn these languages and use this language so that you can, you can reach. The same is true for the modern Christian that needs to make sense of the world around him and digital content and new media arts are windows into the soul of our society. <laughs> and loving the neighbor might very well mean also that you have to understand him. <laughs>